This is Christy Leon Guerrero. I just want to congratulate Pete and my husband, John, as we close in on 1,000 episodes of the Break It Down show. I remember the very first episode and many others recorded at my dining room table, and it's amazing to think that we're approaching 1,000 of them. Some of my favorites were Mick Betancourt, Gabby Reese, all the Jay Moore episodes, our friend Rich Ogden, Taylor Dane, Susie Quattro. There's so many. Go listen and find your own favorites. My husband hosted today's episode, and our guest is someone very special to me, Dr. Andrea Vitz. She is not only a mom, a wife, and an amazing chiropractor, she's a national champion powerlifter, a strength and conditioning coach, an author, and a life coach who specializes in emotional sobriety. Through her work, I learned how to turn my childhood trauma into a simple blip on the screen. I learned about behaviors that were never really mine, but were passed down to me, to accept and love both myself and my abusers. I learned that I was never really broken at all, just trained to respond that way. I don't know who needs to hear this, but you can let go of the pain. It does not have to define you. Dr. Vitz's course and her book will help you, as it has myself and so many others, to start living a life without shame, guilt, jealousy, or fear. You can get her material and reach her and our supportive community at levelheaddoc.com anytime. And if there's anything in your life that is keeping you from performing at your best and enjoying your life and your loved ones to the fullest, you should. Levelheaddoc.com. John and I both train at her gym, Diablo Barbell in Concord, California, and it's drastically helped our health, happiness, longevity, and our lives overall. You can see some of the amazing transformations at Diablo-Barbell.com. Anyway, congratulations to John and Pete. Number 1,000 is coming fast. But first, here is our guest today, my coach, my teacher, my very dear friend, Dr. Andrea Vitz. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this e. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Amy. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> this is Dr. Andrea Vitz with Level Headed Doc. You are watching the Break It Down show. Yes, indeed. Uh, Dr. Andrea Vitz, for our longtime and frequent listeners, um, has been a tremendously important part of my life and her work um, in emotional sobriety has transformed me physically, mentally, emotionally. And um, uh, what else do I want to say about that? Uh, mm -hmm. Aspirationally. Wow. So there. Uh, you are one of the very most important people in my life. Uh, current and current and always. Wow. And uh, I have a tremendous amount of gratitude for all that you have assigned me because I know that I could say you have changed my life and that's true, but really you kicked me in the butt and made me change my life. You and did the work. That's been wonderful. Uh, so I would encourage everybody um, as we get started on this episode to go to levelheaddoc.com and just see what's in there and see what uh, strikes your fancy. The thing I'm really excited about and the reason that I dragged you uh, out here, thank you very much for coming out. Um, two things. First of all, I'm really excited that this is the first three camera shoot for the Break It Down show. It's a big deal. It is technically our most produced episode. Those are Pete's words yesterday. He was like, man, this will be our most produced episode. <laughs> uh, so that part of it's fun. But also I wanted to bring you out because we are uh, nearly complete with the recording of the audiobook version of the You You've Never Met. And it's sounding great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have the benefit of being able to listen back to it. Yes, you are. Because I have all the files. <laughs> <laughs> but you are doing it in real time. And the neat thing about it is that it's the book is a, a tremendously dense read. But having it in audio format in your voice is terrific because nobody can read those words like you can. 
Thank you. Except yeah. for maybe each one of us, you know. Yeah, yeah. Reader. One of the students could do it, I think. Uh, so, but only for ourselves. Like I can read it to me. Yes. But to um, to be able to give an audience that is uh, driving to work or listening while they wash dishes or just, uh, you know, giving people another way to consume this content, um, I think is, is really important. And I'm really glad and I'm really appreciative that you are taking the time to do it because you're taking a lot of time. It's quite a bit of time. It's an undertaking. I'm so honored to do it, though, because if there's somebody out there who can't read the book. Yeah. I want to give another avenue. I always wanted to be accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be a matter of, oh, I can't afford to see you or I can't read or I can't, you know, I can't see. There's people that can't see, right? Yeah. So um, my sister actually inspired me, other than you, to do an audiobook. She's like, got two little boys at home and she's like, I want to read your book, but do you have an audio book? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'll do it for you. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but there's so many people, you know, that want to read it, but it's a dense read. And I think if you hear it, it might be a little bit easier to digest. But the thing about this audiobook too is that I want you still to have a copy of the regular book and I want you to have a copy of the journal because the audiobook is an abridged version. It doesn't have all the exercises in it, which is the work. Yeah, it can't have all the exercises. It cannot. In it. Yeah. No. You have to be able to write. You have to be able to sit and witness and I can't do that on an audio version. So yeah. I think that that's important. Um, I, I think what's going to happen is there are going to be people who introduce themselves to the content in audio, just because there are a lot of us out there who, who consume a lot of audio. I mean, my, um, throughout the course of my busy day, I always have stuff to learn. I always have stuff coming in. You know, I love the, that input. And if I'm doing something with my hands that's repetitive, I don't need to concentrate on that. I can concentrate on taking in what I'm listening to. So there are those who are going to approach the content first that way. And then there are those who are going to say, well, I'll read the book because it'll be better. And there's probably some truth to that. But we all learn different ways and we all learn better when we take things in, in multiple fashions. Yes. So if we bring it in through different channels, I would absolutely love it. If somebody listened to the audiobook and got so inspired to do the actual work mm -hmm. that they maybe took the intensive workshop, right? Yeah. We have one coming up in January Yes. Um, or they took the online course that's getting built right now. Um, that's a little bit more on their own timeline. Or they went and they bought the book in the journal and they did it on their own, but they have this foundation of the concepts in a different way. Yeah. So when they pick up the book, it's not nearly as overwhelming. That is absolutely true. Uh, it's it's such a dense read that there are going to be people who have have a hard time, you know, are going to struggle just churning through the content because what happens for anybody who hasn't read the book is that as you are introduced to these concepts, you have no choice but to apply them to your present life, your past life, Absolutely. all the things that you've been through. And when you're doing the mental inventory while you're also reading and you can't help but do it, it's, it's a lot at once. So it's not exactly a fast read. I mean, you can read it quickly if you... If you're voracious and you have the desire, yeah. absolutely, you can read through it quickly. You might fall asleep in the middle of the chapter yeah. and then wake up, oh no. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know, for me, I didn't have this book, right? But if I had, I absolutely would have done it quickly. Yeah. I was so ready. I was so desirous of real transformation and change because I knew that there's a version of me that really wanted to come out. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, I'll be honest. I read the book because I was so interested in how I could help other people apply it. Beautiful. And it wasn't long before I realized, oh no, I'm applying this right now. And the best way for me to apply it is to live it. Yes. Well, there's two, there's two things that happen. There's the person that picks it up to read it for their spouse or their family, mm -hmm. their sister that they can't stand or their, you know, their mom or their dad you know, that they're not getting along with. Like yeah. I'll show them. 
Um, and then halfway, <laughs> yeah. halfway through the third chapter, they're like, oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm part of this. <laughs> Well, such a beautiful revelation. And you're right. You can't keep it from yourself. Once you learn the content, yeah. you, you're subtly invited to, you know, catch the snake in the grass, mm -hmm. which is that part of you that gets to control you. That isn't really you. And when you start to get a little peek at that snake and yeah. then you come after it and you corner it and you say, I see you. That's what this work does. Yep. And you are revealed the true you. Yes. Now I'm smirking because there's another tendency that some people have. Um, we're going to talk about the workshop in a second, but the other tendency that I think people can suffer from is the tendency to weaponize this knowledge because mm -hmm. this vocabulary makes you look at things differently. I think we've all, um, those of us who are advanced in, in our years have experienced some transformative vocabulary you know especially like when you first entered your professional field whatever it is you start to learn a vocabulary and then you start to build a framework around that vocabulary well what happens mm -hmm. in this content that you've developed is that we we take these words that we're familiar with and we start to use them in very specific ways and so you would now have have developed a framework for the way you process emotions, the way you process reactions, the way you learn to choose reactions, the learn the, the learning of choosing better reactions, all the of learning things, of choosing better responses. Yes. Yes. Responses. Because a reaction is just a reaction, something uh -huh. that you learned and replayed over and over and, and over, over, which and is over not again. you. We never choose a reaction. And yeah. I, I love that because there's there's no excuses. This, this curriculum is all about no excuses. Yeah. It gives you that moment of recognizing where you've been, what's happened to you and really giving like reverence to your life that you've lived so far and the experiences you've had and the person that you've become because of those experiences. So to take those, the ling lingo, so to speak in the book and to use it as an excuse is the exact opposite of what's intended of the work. So I hear what you're saying. I think you're trying to say we don't use emotional sobriety to poke other people and say, see what you're doing wrong? Yeah. You didn't do this right. I know this and you don't. That's just knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge means nothing without action and really living something. And that I will say is the difference between uh, consuming the content. Yeah. And then workshopping the content difference between memorizing and really applying and really apply. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, okay. In the workshop, what, what we learn in the workshop is that you're, you, you begin, you become vulnerable with your workshop. Yeah. Uh, with the mates. groups. Yeah. Yeah. And some people have a hard time with that for a second. Yeah. And then you realize, no, this is good. This is going to be good. It's almost like, uh, I almost don't want to say this. Say it's, it. I will say it. It's almost like, um, an, any intimate relationship where you go, Ooh, I don't know if I want to be naked. And no. then you realize being naked is fun. <laughs> John, you know, so you, John. when you're with, the, yeah, <laughs> if you're in the right setting with the right people, all that stuff. But what happens is you embrace your vulnerability because you realize that everybody else is going to take, it's almost like we challenge each other in the group. Yeah, absolutely. It's an entrainment. You know, if you see someone else being brave and vulnerable and gritty, yeah, it makes you realize I can do that too. Yep. And then you, you muster up some courage and you say one thing and then all of a sudden you open it and you're speaking about all the things that have been holding you back, the things that you haven't been sharing and the things that you've known your entire life maybe yeah. and have never said out loud. Mm -hmm. And it could just be a lie that you told. But when you say the word out loud and you don't have to say anything in my workshop, it's just a massive tool that's offered to you. Yeah. But when you say something out loud that is for lack of a better term been trapped, mm -hmm. it is now out here and you can see it differently. And it knows that you've now seen it. Yeah. 
you've caught the snake in the grass. Right, right. And everyone else exposed. is now after that snake in the grass. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's important, though, that you said that you don't have to say anything. Yeah. Because that's also true. There are you people who attend the workshop and they, everybody goes at their, their own speed and everybody's supportive of you. you're going at your speed. Absolutely. So if you don't want to be vulnerable right now about this thing, whatever it is. Yeah. You can't, okay. you can't force a sobering up moment. You just can't. It has to come from you. It only comes from you. Mm -hmm. You flip the switch. No one can do it for you. Yeah. Does that feel true? Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. But it feels liberating and refreshing and really just good. Yeah. To flip the switch. And then you get good at it and you go, Ooh, I'm going to flip some more switches. It's pretty amazing. You're never done growing. Right. I mean, this yeah. is why being massively humble and being able to check your ego and check where you're sticking a little bit. Like if you, I always say this work is prerequisite work for more advanced work. Mm -hmm. It's like kindergarten. It's opening up your mind, your mind, yeah, not your programmed mind right? to learning new things. So you can go to a, another master teacher and be like, I'm, I'm completely here because I've done this. We kind of just glossed over your mind versus your programmed mind. Yes. And that's something that we can gloss over because we've, you and I have yeah, discussed this at length. Yeah. At length. Um, but man, I have a lot of, a lot of, um, instances where I can recall in my life where programming just took over because that's what it does. Yes. It takes over. And now when I go back and think, you know, if I had a better understanding of my own motives mm -hmm. in that moment, or if I had a better understanding of uh, how I was communicating and what I was putting out, uh, my life would be a little different. And I'm not saying that in, in you know, in any way to, to um, fail to be appreciative for where I am right now, because this path is great and I'm exactly where I need to be. Uh, but I do think the effectiveness that I feel now, and I'll mark like I'll timestamp age 50, the effectiveness that I feel at age 50, I just think, man, if I had begun feeling that at age 20. Yes. And you can, yeah. I, 20 year olds out there, you can sure. feel that level of clarity that John's talking about. It's this, this ultimate self-honesty. Mm -hmm. And like you said, checking motive that if anything, if you get anything from emotional sobriety training, it's, I want you to be able to check your motive. Mm -hmm. It's so important knowing the why behind what you are thinking, feeling, and doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's missing from a lot of, a lot of our lives. Yeah. It's missing from a lot of people and the actions that, that a lot of us take in the course of our day that affect others Yeah, and that affect others in ways. And, and that's the other thing is that sometimes we don't realize that we're, we're pushing levers to manipulate something. Nobody likes to use the word manipulate, oh. but we are pushing levers to manipulate. Well, things. let's, let's soften the word manipulate. Yeah. It's using your hands, Manny, right? Manny, yeah. So we're just changing something with our will. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we could have the biggest hearts and the best of intentions, but there's the program, the ego mind, the traumatized mind, or what I'd call the intoxicated identity that actually has the reins. Wow. So you could be this wonderfully loving person mm -hmm. and still be manipulating your family. So that's where, that's why we say catching the snake in the grass because it's sneaky. Yeah. Not even you can see it. Okay. So <laughs> as you describe this first, my first thought is, oh, I remember this person doing that. And I remember that person behaving that way. And I remember this person being very loving, very caring, very sincere about their affection for me and for whomever else, but being man manipulative. Yeah. And then I caught that snake in the grass and I thought, well, you know what? I can't change that. When did I do it? Mm -hmm. And how yes. can, so that's the other, the other lesson is that we, we start to apply these lessons to the, the people we know and, the, and those who are around us and the actions we can see that they're doing. But very quickly we realize, especially when you 
learn to flip your vulnerability switches and you yeah. exercise that you start to realize, okay, let me look, let me look within first. Well, that's the only place. Yeah. That's the only place you can look. It, I think the biggest thing that the, the most red word you'll probably see in this book is self-responsibility, self-responsibility, self-responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's always the first you can look at someone else and maybe look for their filters, their trauma filters. Mm -hmm. And so that you can soothe them, but not to judge them to help you in a conflict, but never to manipulate. Right. So there's this, very important responsibility when you become emotionally sober. And you were talking about that clarity, yeah. knowing your motive, level headedness, managing and not really making the destructive emotions in your body anymore, because you don't have the same perspective that would make you believe the things that you used to believe that would make you feel the way that you used to feel. Mm -hmm. And then also the peace that goes with that. Those are the three promises of yeah. love of uh, emotional sobriety is clarity, level headedness, and peace. Those are, if you have those as a foundation of a, in your personality, everyone feels safe with you. That's I'm going to ruminate on that for a second, because I think, uh, especially our longtime listeners know, I, I have a reputation for having an even keel. And I have all my life. I've been my dad's the same way. And I, and I learned and inherited some things from him that I really cherish in my ability to um, approach situations that way. So I thought I was really good at it, but really having the tools to understand those responses and to craft those responses better. How was your internal environment? Because you, you're very even keel. I totally agree. Even before you did the work, mm -hmm. but was your internal environment matching that all the time? No. So no. my, so you learned how to really be level on the outside to yeah. be that beacon of strength for those around you to never lose it. Well, yeah. And to, yeah. Be, and, and to, and to be fair to that skill set, I was pretty good at doing it but it's almost like somebody who's mechanically inclined mm. and then they go to engineering school <laughs> it's a different it's a different thing now you have a real skill that has measurement and yeah. application of wisdom that has come before you and the ability to apply your intuitions to something that's you know so, something that's a little more concrete yeah so it was that. I mean, I, I could say that I was always pretty good at diffusing situations, pretty good at analyzing um, how I could help somebody get to a place they were trying to get, whatever it was they were arguing for, how to create situations where both sides win, something like that. But it's different when you actually have a toolkit. Yeah. You know, and, and then you can start to identify on a more minute level where your um, emotional responses are, where your ability to uh, n not manipulate, but open a situation up for somebody else's, you know, exploration or their fulfillment in, in this situation. You know, I don't want to be transactional about it, but to, to a certain degree, I do look at somebody who's emotionally charged, you know, I want to receive whatever their, their energy is about. I know they want to get to a happy place. Maybe they don't, but I, but I want to help them at least, you know, you show them wanna, a path to that. Yeah. You want to eliminate needless suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's really what emotional sobriety does. It shows you that you are needlessly suffering the yeah. majority of the time, if yeah. not all the time. And even if it's softer than what some people would term suffering, if it's just friction. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. We've talked friction. about removing friction. Remove quite the a bit. friction. Yes. So I from think, everywhere. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really great skill that I've gotten better at with with this work. Um, and I like how you say you don't want to be transactional, but there's a formula. Yeah. So you want to be precise. 
Mm -hmm. And in that precision, you have understanding yeah, and you have more practical approaches that you can use and not get lost in their emotion. Yeah. Because when we're first emotional, becoming emotionally sober, we're not, we don't always have our sea legs yet. Yep. So you can easily get pulled into what I call the familiar energy crisis. Mm -hmm. The familiar energy, you go to work, you have the same environment that you have to walk into. You have a new perspective and you have new self-control and self-management and all these amazing tools that you've practiced in the solitude of your home. Yeah. But when you go into the storm, how mm -hmm. are you behaving? That's where we train. We train in the storm. We train in the harsh conditions. And so that we are always the safest person in the room the most honest person in the room, right? The most level-headed and clear person in the room. That's mm -hmm. what I want all my students to be able to become for their environments. Okay. I'm gonna do something real quick. <laughs> Just a little technical step that I think is gonna help me out here because we're having a couple of sound issues that I hope nobody's noticing, but I'm noticing them. So I'm gonna do that. Um, I think that's going to help me out a little bit. I also want to uh, talk with you about how you and this coursework. When you wrote the book, you were writing conceptually and you were writing based on things that you made work for you. Yes. Now that you've had dozens of people in workshops and you've seen transformations, and so have I, Yeah. Um, of people in the way that they approach their lives, their goals, their desires, their behaviors, um, their relationships. What has changed? Has anything changed? Have you, have you um, experienced a, an evolution of the work? That's a great question. Just to back up a little bit, when I was first writing this book, it wasn't only based on my, my experiences. This is also based on the many, 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 many people that I worked with mm -hmm. using these methods that I used for myself and just witnessing them transform. And, and really the work just kept evolving and evolving and advancing. And then pretty soon after several years, maybe seven or eight years, I just thought this has to come out of me all the way. Like mm -hmm. I have to get this all into one place. Yeah. And this book was 600 and something pages. And my editor's like, can we please make this two books? <laughs> so I have a second book coming out called um, the advanced practices portion. But to answer you, yes, it is even still continued to evolve and advance and improve through the workshops. And there's something about, you know, when I used to coach people, it was one-on-one. -on -one. Right. I do still coach people one on one, but in the infancy of this work, yeah, you know, a lot of my experience came from one on one coaching and a lot of volunteering, hours and hours of volunteering, staying up all night with people. You know, when my daughter would go to sleep, I would stay up through the night with somebody who was suffering and just do the work that I needed to do to create the help for everyone that I could get my hands on, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so doing the workshops in a group setting has really shown the benefit of entrainment, you know, that ability to get cadence with somebody else who's advanced, yeah. somebody else who went all in. I've had, you know, our first workshop, we were totally full. It mm -hmm. was going to be live and then COVID hit yeah. and we got shut down. Yeah. But, you know, I would say 80% of the people actually get it. And that was not a number I would have predicted. I would have predicted somewhere around 5%, to be honest, yeah. in the first beginning, because it takes this level of courage and this level of all in mentality. I want this so bad. I will do anything to have it. And because you have one or two people that are doing that and that are vulnerable, like you said, that is the magic. Mm -hmm. People love it. People want that. People see the peace. They see the transformation of their neighbor. And they say, I want what you have. And yeah. they can't keep it from themselves. Like you said, once you read the content, it's always in your head. Yeah, You're playing with your kids. You're thinking, oh, what's my motive here? Mm -hmm. What's this? What was I thinking when I said this to my husband? What was I doing when I said that to my mom? Did I actually mean that? Am I lying to myself? These are just very, very basic examples of the thousands of things that you're going to be thinking due to this work. 
But yeah, absolutely. It's been such an eye-opening and humbling experience to see these people really get it. And, you know, I have the luxury of knowing a lot of my students after I've worked with them in a group setting because a lot of them have, you know, train in my gym. Um, some of them are, you know, just colleagues or dear friends and just seeing, continuing to see so intimately their evolution. Yeah. It's so amazing. Yeah. And it really keeps me in a position where I always want to level up. You know, I don't get complacent. Okay. Because that can be very tempting when you overcome suffering. Sure. And you overcome strong, deep-seated personality disorders, for lack of a better term. And you get to this place of peace. Oh, I'm here now. Clarity. Yeah, I'm good. I'm just going to stay here. Yeah, no, it's so much fun to keep growing. Keep growing. Yeah. I'll give you some perspective on a couple of things that you said. You, you talked about um, the things that you think as you play with your child or yeah. you engage in your relationship with whomever. Uh, I would sharpen that by saying that you have now a better set of instincts. You know, it's not so much that you think about the stuff as you do it. It's that you intuit more sharply, more thoroughly. Yes. And because you now have, you have entrained a sequence, you just run through the sequence. Yeah. Well, you're, you're present. Yeah. You're present in a totally new way, maybe for the first time in your life. Mm -hmm. That presence is what I call the moment of sobering up emotionally speaking. Yeah. It's like. And that's what creates the clarity. Yeah. yeah. And you're, you're so clear that you, all of a sudden, I love the word intuition because mm -hmm. you do, you naturally now know how to handle things that once were not possible for you. Yeah. You felt like or I have to call this best, person. Not easy. Not easy or not possible. And now. It's just obvious. Yeah. You don't have to make it complicated. Well, the, the, the one of the other things that I learned, um, and it's not even specific to curriculum, but it's just something that we do over and over again, um, is the the difference between easy and simple. Hey, yeah. Because there's always going to be stuff that's not easy. Yeah. But if you can make it simple. A formula sure makes it simple. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have a way to attack it. And taking responsibility and personally demanding yourself to do something. Mm -hmm. You have to be diligent with your mental and emotional health. Yeah. It isn't something that comes for free. You don't grow up without effort. Age does not promise maturity. That's true. It That's does not. True. You don't just get over and suddenly have all the answers. Mm -hmm. You have to search for them. You have to dig up who you really are from underneath the rubble of your past trauma, from the past wrongs that you've done, get the shame out, get the dishonesty out. Yeah. And then your love just, you know, just, oh yeah, this is what I made of. I'm just love. Literally, that's all you are. If you feel anything but that, it's not you. Yeah. And it's really a shame how many people, um, don't get, don't allow themselves to experience that. Oh yeah. It's, it feels real it's nice. It's more fun. So much fun to love. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Let's talk about the audio book. I would love to. What have you gotten from the process of reading this book aloud <laughs> to yourself or to me? Other than a couple <laughs> typos. <laughs> um, reading this book aloud. What have I noticed? I noticed how much I want to be beside every single person who's reading it mm -hmm. physically. Wow. It's really, that's my, my one challenge I have left in life. <laughs> how can I be next to every human that's, that's a that challenge. reads this book? That's um, something to figure out. Yeah. I just, because, you know, I don't want anything to be interpreted in a way that the snake is interpreting. Okay. I want it to be read exactly as it is written because I, I don't know if you know, but I'm pretty much a straight shooter. <laughs> mm. I'm very direct and that's the way I love. Yeah. I've experienced the straight <laughs> shooting. Yeah. I experienced the straight shooting, um, starting with how we met, which was, I was a, a patient of yours on the chiropractic table. And then your straight shooting said, you know, if you were stronger, we wouldn't have to do this this often. <laughs> And that was, that was a tough pill to swallow because I felt like I was pretty strong. Right. I didn't know. You didn't know. 
And uh, well, no one knows, right? You don't know until you know. We're ignorant, yeah, not innocent, yes, yeah. And everybody, you really don't know how strong you are, you have no idea emotionally, mentally, mm -hmm. physically. There's so much you don't know about you, yeah. There's a you you've never met, in it fact. I, yeah, I've met mine, yeah, you have, yeah. I like him. He's all right. He's pretty dang it, cool. Turns out, turns out he's okay. He's he's pretty fun to have a beer with sometimes. Uh, <laughs> he has also uh, re-engaged his love of music. He has re-engaged his love of many people. He has re-engaged um, an appreciation for everything. My parents. Oh yeah. My the just, gratitude is very full in you, Mister. Yeah. Okay. You feel that? Yes. The awe. Yeah, that's that's where you are your strongest is when you're in that reverence for everything. Yeah, it's almost overwhelming sometimes. It should be. That's what real gratitude feels like. Yeah. So many people misunderstood understand gratitude. Hmm. Gratitude is not something you think. It's not a thank you note. It's not a list. Mm -hmm. It's not even like, wow, I'm lucky to have a toilet. <laughs> it's yeah. being so blown away uh -huh. that there's plumbing in your house. Yeah. That you could almost that you can't stand it. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's waking up and and recognizing I have a heart that just beats. Yeah, how is that even? I'm not asking it to. I it can't even make it. it. I can't make it stop. I can't make it start. I I'm breathing even if I'm not thinking about it. I mean we are magical. Yeah, we are magical. We're so blessed. Like we're so we have so much to be grateful for, mm -hmm. and really feel it. Yeah, and you really feel it. I, I can do. Tell. I really live in it because it's yeah. fun. It's I the mean, best. <laughs> it has created the um I really embrace conditioning, the physical part of your workouts. Of my workouts. Yeah. I really embrace the conditioning because I go to a different place when I'm really huffing and puffing. When I started training after you you said that we would my back would hurt less if I was stronger. Yeah. Um I sort of my first thing to embrace was to tell myself that Every time I took that hard breath, you yes. know, when you're really huffing and puffing, every time, every one of those breaths, I imagined were five I get to take later. Mm -hmm. So I was extending my life with every one of those strained, hardy At breaths least five with, times. with five breaths added on to the end. So that made it so that every time I got in that place where I was really, really huffing and puffing, that I felt a, a reason. And, you know, and I felt a motivation for, yeah, g give me those. Give me more of those. You had a clear intention. Yes. And and by intention, I mean, think of like a tightrope. Mm -hmm. This is how I teach it in my workshop. Intention is seeing where you want to end up attaching or affixing the end of a rope to that point mm -hmm. and holding tension along that rope so you can walk across it. The walking across it is the action. Yeah. But you have to be so connected to that end point yes. and you always were and that's why you lost what 50 60 pounds like that yeah. and your back how how much does that hurt not much right so yeah. so let's think about that i love what you said about if you get stronger your back will hurt less if you get emotionally stronger everything your will heart hurt will hurt less yeah everything will hurt less your life becomes simple yep your relationships become simple. And when a relationship is simple, they get to be real. Yeah. They get this space to all. I have a lot of people who have met their spouses for the first time. Wow. You know where this is crucial. I never realized this. And now I'm, uh, I'm understanding my own relationship with my spouse. Uh, it was also pretty cool. Love. I, I, won't say that I met her for the first time. I, I think we've gone through a lot of meeting each other along the way. But now that we're in a different stage of our lives, because we're both in our 50s now, in our 50s. Just um, began. Yeah. And we've both experienced these new beginnings and this newfound clarity and so I won't say that we're just meeting each other for the first time, but we certainly are re-meeting each other on terms we like better. Oh, yeah. And that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun, especially when you're entering a, a, 
a stage of your life that's different. 25 years you've been married, yeah? You're married 25 years. So and think about that. How many other people, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, no, but please. how many other people do you know that have been married for 25 years uh -huh. that have a legitimate, long-standing, real... Yeah. They weren't all easy, by the way. But no, real <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, this real transformation uh -huh. physically and emotionally as opposed to just it getting worse and worse, more hiding from each other, more lying to each other, yeah. more chronic disease because they can't talk. Yep. They can't get away. They feel obligated. They feel stuck. They feel massive resentment and hurt from past pain. Oh, man. And you two have done the opposite. Yeah. You've opened it all up and created a new a new marriage from one that was already pretty dang good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, she pisses me off. Um <laughs> She does not. I know you. I think that one of the important things about refinding something in a relationship is that you get to start over because we all reminisce about the freshness of the relationship, the newness. There's something to that novelty yeah. that is really cool. You know, when you think back about how you met and the romantic part, the romantic, the meet cute, it, it, yes. Uh, you can create a or refresh a lot of those things by taking a better look in a different yeah. way and then m improving yourself so that your spouse gets to take a better look at you in a different way. You nailed it because you said yourself. Yeah. You don't say, honey, you should refresh it. You say, I'm going to. Mm -hmm. And you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess it's been. And you did it. It. Yes, I have. And yes, that's been the driver, but she has to. She absolutely has. Yeah. So there's been a lot happening there that makes makes it all, you know, in a lot of ways new again. And new is important in 25 years, I suppose. Oh, yeah. I mean, I liked the, you know, uh, there's a lot to like about the, the 25, but some newness is cool. Well, that's what we love about emotional sobriety and level-headed doc community in general is that it is for everyone. Yeah. If there's anyone who needs any kind of support or struggles with jealousy, sadness, fear, childishness, mm -hmm. right? Resentment, anger, you know, affairs, overcoming affairs, overcoming childhood trauma. Yeah. All things that you can get from this work. Uh, maybe we should talk about those things because we are talking about these things in terms where you know, it seems like everything's it's it's easy for somebody, I think, who's out there who's facing particular challenges to go. Yeah, it was probably like that for you because you weren't dealing with, uh, of course, you know, overcoming an affair. Or um, yeah. Things. And I'll stop you there because I, I like to tell people your struggles are not unique. They're just not unique. They may be different mm -hmm. in situation. It's and hard circumstance. for a lot of people to swallow. It's really hard. And I say it with all love. Mm -hmm and experience yeah. your and so and, 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 and an offering you. of support and a massive offering of support yeah yeah i can't tell you how much support yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know when you hear the words your suffering is not unique it's easy to get defensive about that well you don't yeah. know because you've never been me and you right. and these things and the all the hundreds is, of other people said the same thing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is it's not about making it so that you are failing to justify that you've been through things that determine oh. some things and, and deserve acknowledgement. Right. It's not that. Oh, no. It's to say that the others who are around you who offer up uh, this sense of community have been places as well that will allow them to support you. You may have layers and layers of trauma. Yeah. And that makes your suffering or your experience unique, but not your suffering. Mm -hmm. The solution, the reason it's not unique is because the solution is the same. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't matter yeah. why. What matters is solving it. Yep. That's and if true. you feel defensive, it might be because you want to still suffer because you're so used to it. And people don't believe that could be a possibility, but it's a chemical. Mm-hmm. If you can get addicted to an exogenous chemical, you definitely can get addicted to an endogenous chemical or a chemical made in your body. Yeah. We become patterned to make and feel 
and really attach ourselves to fear, mm -hmm. attach ourselves to resentment whether we learned it from our childhood or experienced something in our childhood and just kept practicing and practicing, it becomes a skill. So no, your trauma may be unique. I'm going to slow might, you. I yeah. want to slow you down because there are slow people out there down. who are thinking, uh, I don't get that. But here's the reality that we're dealing with is that our, our vehicles are entrained to keep us alive. And even if you are, in fear, if you're in, in a cave and you're not running out onto the savanna where you can be eaten by a lion, yes, you are still alive. So your body wants to keep you in a place where regardless of how healthy or unhealthy it is, it's still breathing in and out and it wants that. Well, that's a very normal fear yeah. to not be eaten. Okay. It's just, <laughs> it's just the basis of my example. Yes, of course. But the, but the realities that we have are more complex than that. The, the application is the same. They needn't be complex. Yeah. Your That's body though wants yeah. you to, and you're talking about the addiction to, to endogenous chemicals. Yes. The endogenous chemicals remind us that, Hey, this, never mind whether it sucks, you're still alive. Yeah. So stay here. Yes. Because you're still alive. Because surviving is better right. than not. Yeah. Yes. And so that's the really what defines the um, addiction to the endogenous chemical. If, you, if you're out there and you're thinking, no, that's not me. That doesn't describe me. Just think for a second. Yeah. If you didn't have it, would you be more alive? Also, I'll challenge everybody to think about how you define yourself because that's another thing that we've talked about when we yeah. say things like well you know i drink because i'm irish oh yeah what are your genetics yeah I, what are the excuses of course you i make? do that because yep. i am and yeah. you have or we're this... all cheaters because you know we mm -hmm. yeah it's not true right yeah it's not an excuse um i love that it, it's really important to that's that self-honesty component and being diligent and kind of getting over yourself and when i say that i don't mean like get over yourself i mean rise above yourself in mm -hmm. your current state and really take a good look. Yeah. You can see yourself better from there. Yes, you sure can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's um, fair. You know, when, when we begin this work and we start to really go in on when we're starting to realize some progress, when we're starting to really feel good and now we can apply this work to more aspirational stuff. Yeah. You know, maybe I've fixed a lot of the things that I want to quote unquote fix. And now I feel like I can proceed. So my effectiveness is not just, has not just caught me up, but now I can, now I have some clarity and I can really start to get ahead. Let's talk about your life with that toolkit that allows you to be more effective in your relationships, personal, professional, in oh, leadership. Yeah all of that stuff, because I think there are a lot of people out there who don't necessarily need quote unquote fixing. Mm -hmm. Although what's going to happen as, as we've seen and experienced is that, Oh, you do have stuff. You might as well, well yeah. be honest with it and fix it. But now that, you know, you've put yourself in a better position to look forward as opposed to looking back. Um, how do you think the audio book specifically is going to bring people um, further when let's say I've read the book. Oh, yeah. And now the audio book comes out and it's like, well, it's an abridged version. Why yep. would I want that? How is that going to bolster my ability to repetitive, repetitive, repetitive? You're in your car driving. You've done the work already. You're going to pick up new information. Mm -hmm. You could listen to the book a hundred times. You could read the book a hundred times. You're going to pick up new information. Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to say, oh, I wish I had known that. Yeah. As if it hadn't been there the whole time. It's yes. It's the aha moment okay. that continues again and again. And so to answer your question, especially specifically about leadership, this is so important. We don't have emotionally sober leaders. We desperately need them. Mm -hmm. And I don't really think we have a lot of needs, but that is one of them. It sure so would help a lot. It would help a lot. Yeah. And what I mean by that is there's a level of stability and security and safety that's uh -huh. required in a leader. And the way to get that or to achieve that is so that you are essentially unassailable. Hmm. Nothing you say to me 
will change me emotionally speaking. That is an emotionally sober leader. Yeah. When I've done so much work on myself that I can't be stirred emotionally yeah. because what can control how you feel controls you. Think about uh, our leaders out there. Think about being unassailable and what that does for your ability to process, for your ability to really determine um, the you know, the moves in a situation that would benefit you and your team the most. It might feel impossible. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, there's still things that happen in my life that kind of tug at my heart, Yeah. you know, but nothing that pulls me out of my mission. You know, if we look back at the leaders that we admire though, yeah, the, the easiest thing to identify in what makes you admire somebody is their ability to be steadfast in the storm structurally having structural integrity is mm -hmm. kind of what i look at it as yeah. you get building has integrity we have to have that kind of integrity in our emotional state in our mental state mm. in our capacity to have compassion and poise because if i'm a blubbering mess sad yeah because you're sad how is that helping how what First of all, if I'm oh, suffering, it's so I'm not helping anyone. <laughs> yeah, it's so destructive. I think we've all been in those situations where you look to someone for help and that person's a mess. Yeah, and you're like, come on. Yeah, but a I'm lot really of people on you, look right? for another mess. Yeah. And I don't true. mean that in that nasty way. I just mean like someone else who's feeling the same way they're feeling because it validates that feeling. Yeah. And, it's, and that's okay to validate someone's feelings. Mm -hmm. It's re recognize you're feeling this way. You can choose something different by looking at it in a new way and by being a new you. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a tech time out for two reasons. Number one, my uh, we're doing this three camera show. Hey, I want to shout out uh, our, our producer today and it's Doug Marcos and he's running the cameras. My camera is going to run out of juice. So I'm going to change the angle and plug it in. <laughs> Uh, how I we, love your authenticity. How are we doing on time? We're oh my goodness. We have one minute. We have, <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> we have like eleven minutes. We have like eleven minutes. How do we just have eleven minutes? I um, know. I feel like we just started. Yeah. What? What do you want to uh, highlight um, that's coming up that you really want to expose people to? That you really want? Oh, that emotional sobriety is a global movement. Mm -hmm. And it's in its infancy. So the more people want to step up and experience it and contribute to it, the better right yeah. now. Because when you make the change in you, it becomes contagious. Hmm. Everyone around me wants emotional sobriety. Yeah. It's pretty rare um, that somebody doesn't. And if they don't, they're just not ready. Yeah. And by not ready, I don't mean that you should feel ready because mm -hmm. more than likely you're not going to, but that doesn't matter because I'm ready to help and to lead you. But the people who aren't ready to even look. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that I really enjoy is the uh, way that the community, everybody in the community just loves on each other. Oh yeah. And so much on honest, authentic love. It's a, it's a lot of fun because there are people from all walks of life. We all have, you know, some common interests and some disparate interests and everybody's all over the place. But it's the so thing different. that we have in common is that we support each other in a way that's unusual for its intensity. Yeah. Unusual for its sincerity and a lot of fun. We don't have competition. We have love. Yeah. And really urgency. Mm -hmm. We hold. I was going to say a little bit of competition, but it's not well, a competition. It's, it's urgency. It's like playing soccer. Yeah. You know, it's not, it isn't a, it isn't the same thing as like an egoic com competition. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, beautiful. It, it, it starts with support. Well, so, yeah, that's nobody fine. does us alone. Okay. We have to be a sounding board for each other. We have to be mirrors for each other. There's a reason that we get better in relation. But I, but I don't want to alienate anybody because it's okay to do it alone. Oh, absolutely. It's okay to start it alone. I did a lot of it alone. What's yeah. going to happen though is that you will feel the desire to reach out. 
I would, yeah, I would, I would say the majority of the work is done in solitude. Uh It's when you're alone in your thoughts. It's when you're doing the work. Yeah. When you get stuck, you reach out. There is a satisfaction though in, in helping other people and in being helped. Oh yeah. We've had so many people in our community step up and form homework groups. And those people have shown, I mean, they are stunning at how much work they've done. Yeah. I had a girl who brought me her journal. Our, we have a companion journal to the you you've never met. Totally filled out in the midst of the workshop. It's four weekends every Sunday for three hours. And she had it completely filled out. And that's not very common, mm. especially completed. And she really looked, she really searched. She was really diligent and honest. You can imagine she had a really big turnaround. Now, why we need community is because of our regression. Yeah. When we get a big push forward, our ego really will pull us back. Our bodies will pull us back. And we're going to want that next hit of what we've been addicted to or the next pattern that we've been continuing to be so good at for the last 20, 50, 70 years. So it makes sense that you pull back. Is And having that community and that leadership to say, it's okay that you pull back. It's okay. It's expected. Let's do the next right thing. Hmm. Just keep doing the work. Just keep doing the work. Build the skill as if it's a new skill. Yeah. If I give you a hammer, it doesn't make you a carpenter. I've experienced that. I've experienced that so many times too. The, you know, regression, following a big push forward, yep. and then the support. It's like, ah, you're good. Yeah, Let's you're fine. Going. Let's keep going. If you didn't regress, it means you didn't go forward. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we like that. I look for that. In fact, I warn people they'll have a big breakthrough. I'm like, okay, just know that if you d- realize that you start doing this again, I would expect that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's okay. And it's okay. Just reach out to me. Yeah. Reach out to a member. Yeah. How has how has it been? You always offer your you famously say, I'm always here for you. <laughs> and you have absolutely always been here for me. And you've always been here for my wife. That's that's all I can witness. I imagine you. Um, I'm always here for you. For, yes. Yes. But I imagine you're always here for everybody. How has that been as the community has grown bigger and wider? And It's fine. Yeah. It's great. I don't. Still I'm, manageable? Yeah. It almost feels like I expand as the community extends. Okay. <laughs> so my my ability to be there literally for anyone. Yeah. Okay. Now to clarify, Mm -hmm. I'm always there for you. Yeah. But there is a condition. I know. (laughs) Please talk about it. (laughs) What do you think the condition is? Well, the condition is that you have to be honest with yourself. And when you come and when when you come for help, you have to bring it. And then when there and and there's and there's going to be a plan. Yes. And And you're going to take action. You have to take action. So it's not a I'm always here for you. So you can call me at seven o'clock every morning and bitch and mom. Yep. It's I'm always here for you so we can figure out your solution so you can do it. Yes. So the condition is you have to do the work. You have to solve the problem. Yeah. The good news is we already have the solution. So there's not a whole lot of time that we need to waste there. Yeah. So, okay. From that standpoint, I think, uh, makes it a lot easier. it, It does. It makes it a lot easier, a lot simpler, a lot more, um, manageable. Yes. Because you really, yeah, I'm just looking back at, oh man, you know, when I really needed to talk to you, it's okay. I really need you to hold this mirror up for me. Yeah. And then. And you, and you know, the, you know, the answer. Yeah. And this is why I love this work because this work is for everyone. I mean, not everyone, I think everybody requires some form of it. Yeah. Um, but also it's for everyone, meaning it's accessible for everyone. It's not uh, crystals. It's not new age. Not that that doesn't work. That's extraordinary work too. And it's also not psychology and it's not counseling and it's nothing in between. Yeah. So there's nothing polarizing about this work. Mm -hmm. It's not religious. Everyone can use and apply this work. And that was my primary intention. And by the way, if you do have a faith that is your basis of your morality, whatever you want to do. There's no interruption to whatever makes you whole, right? There's no interruption to whatever fulfills your soul. However you want to do it. In fact, that will help. 
Yeah. Yeah. It'll aid you to believe in something greater, mm -hmm. a power, love. Yep. If you believe in love, you're going to do better at this work. Yeah. And if you do better at believing in love, where are the limits? There's none. Yeah. Okay, cool. John, you're extraordinary. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I've discovered my extraordinariness in a lot of different ways. Um, and I will say also about this work that, you know, when we, I, of course, mirror um, my physical transformation, my emotional transformation, but it's sometimes easier to explain in the physical sense. Cause I remember one moment in particular where I was huffing and puffing and I was carrying something. Actually, I was pushing the war wagon and I was, you know, I had reached my, what I thought was my limit. And I remember you saying the the new you is right at the finish line. Yeah. Go meet it. Go meet him and there. I was so charged to go do that, that it turns out I had in me what it took to get to the finish line. And I can credit you for getting me to the finish line. But you didn't do it. I helped you set I, your intention. And this is always what this work has been about is that, uh, guess what, everybody, you have to do it. You have to do it. Yeah. You have to do it. It's your job. But there is a clear path and there is a there is a, a, an end point to, to attach that line. And you will be huffing and puffing. And, and you, you will be, be you may struggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. You're totally supported. You're totally safe. Yep. As Marcus Aurelius said, the obstacle is the path. Mm. So. I there. say let's clear the obstacles. Just let's clean it up. Yeah.